Welcome to another Unscripted Faith. Listen, our Redeemer lives, and today we get to dive into that. I'm Angela Madden, and I'm here with the one, the only, Pastor J. Anthony Gilbert. <laughs> we in the house, y'all. We're ready to do this today. I'm so excited because we've got the world's most legendary bounty hunter in the building today, not in the building, but on air today. But, you know, I think about it. It's a doggy dog's world today. Oh, shoot. Doggy I'm dog. excited. It's a doggy <laughs> dog's world. It's going to be great. Talking about faith, hope, redemption. Yes. You know, our Redeemer lives and he redeems everything that we walk through, everything that we encounter. He takes what the devil means for evil and turns it for our good. Yes, he does. And I think dog is going to have a lot to say about that. Amen to that. So mm -hmm. let's get in on this right now because joining us is a man who's fought crime and is known for popular TV programs that follow his life and adventures as the one and only bounty hunter. Dog the Bounty Hunter, Dwayne Chapman has seen God move in his life and he joins us now to share more about his incredible faith journey. Dog, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you here on Unscripted Faith. Well, the honor is all mine. Thank you very, very much. Aloha. Well, listen, I am so excited. We are so excited. Yes. We can't wait to get in on this. So let me, I want to know a little bit of the story behind the glory. So everybody knows you on television and all of that, but we know there's a face side to you. The first thing is, and this came from one of our producers. They had asked me, said, can you ask him, where did he get the name Dog from? Ooh, well, I was in a motorcycle gang. Uh, the Devil's Disciples, which is a sister club to the Hells Angels. And uh, we all back then had nicknames. So uh, I was raised Assembly of God, and I knew, you know, say, Phil with the Holy Ghost, I knew God very much. And then uh, about 17 or 18 years old, I, uh, you know, I don't want to say I backslid, but I was lukewarm because I don't know about God spitting me out of his mouth, but. I uh, did not live for God. So I, in, in the motorcycle club, I was always like, some of the food we ate was terrible. So I would always, you know, let's say the blessing or when the, some, or a couple of the brothers would curse God, I would like, we rode in, in twos and threes and nines and I would back my Harley off and go, you know, make the sign of the cross and go, whoa, man. And so when my president named me, we had, a guy named the preacher who was not a preacher. We had a guy named John the Baptist who rode his <laughs> three wheeler in water all the time. And so uh, I was the one, even though I was very young, I like started the fights and I was a, a, a pretty big mouth. Just, uh, you know, I guess I still am. <laughs> and so I uh, was, uh, was made Sergeant of Arms at a very, very young age. That means I started the fights. I wasn't the toughest. <clears throat> but I started the fights and so he brought me in. He said, you're very loyal. I showed up for everything, <clears throat> you know, man's best friend, da, da, da. And so I always showed up. I always went to all the club meetings. I always went to, I would guess they call them today picnics. I always went to the robberies. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, sorry. So uh, he said, you know what? Uh, I'm going to nickname you dog. And I said, well, I thought it was, you know, the reason, because I was loyal, I showed up. And I said, his name was Hudat. And I said, well, thank you, Prez. And uh, he said, you know why? And I said, yeah, because I show up. I said, no, you always talk about God. And he said, uh, <clears throat> you know, God's name spelled backwards is dog. And I hereby christen you dog. And so that was a very young age. A lot of people ask me, what do you want to be called? In school, in grade school, I was, you know, my real name is Dwayne, and I would be teased, Dwayne the bathtub, I'm drowning. <clears throat> and I would get in a lot of fights, you know, because I don't like to be called names. Still, to this day, I don't. And uh, so I prefer dog over anything. Uh, there is my friends who can call me Dwayne, and my mama used to call me Dwayne, but I'd rather be called dog, but that's where I got the nickname, D-O-G. Wow, I think that's so fascinating that these guys, these hellraisers, as they say, right, were running around and you had a John the Baptist. You, <laughs> yeah, what's you that had all the about? preacher. Yeah, like how well, did that even... This, sorry, this was in the 70s where, you know, uh, evil was there, but even the devil's heard believed in Jesus and said prayers and all that. 
today, you know, what, 40, 50 years later, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but wow, what it's like some of the stuff coming up today, you know, is like incredible. So God was more prevalent. I mean, there's a lot more Christians today. Okay. There's the, as you know, the Bible says in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh yes, sir. and we are living in the last days, but it also says evil, uh, evil will abound and there's much evil in the world. Back then there wasn't that much, uh, you know, the morality was still morality. I mean, there weren't guys, you know, cutting off things, being girls and, you know, we call, well, back then they were something mentally wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and today laws are being passed that it's okay. Da, da, da. So uh, even back then, you know, riding with the devil's disciples was a lot <clears throat> more morale and more God and, than there is today. Wow. So how do you, you were raised, you said Assemblies of God, AG. How did yes. you find yourself connected with the devil's disciples? Well, you know, I, I have a lot of mentors and, uh, I guess you'd call them psychologists and <clears throat> through my life, you know, my father beat me very, very bad. I had two sisters and he'd say, pull down your pants, get over the couch from way young, three, four years old that I can remember. Wow. And, uh, you know, Bruce, he didn't use a belt. He used a board. And my thighs, the back of my thighs, he wouldn't hit my buttocks. He would hit the back of my thighs. And they were so, I mean, they were, they were whelps. We showered in school back then. I wouldn't even shower in school. So kids tease me about, you know, being dirty. I mean, so uh, I believe that, you know, and I, I don't need a psychiatrist or, or uh, a pastor to tell me that the authority that he had, I ran away 16 times, wanted by the cops. And the authority that he had, I just hated cops. I hated anybody with authority. You know, one time I turned him into my vice president, my vice principal at school. My vice principal called my dad down there. And then the vice principal stuck up for my dad and said, yeah, spare the rod or, or yeah, spare the rod, spoil the child. And so I, a lot of people say, well, if your dad wouldn't have beat you like that, you wouldn't be the man you are today. Well, I tell them, you know what? I'd have been ahead of the FBI. Mm. I guarantee you, because I'm a law, I, I love law enforcement. So the beatings that I took like that, you know, turned me away. They turned me away. And then as I got older, I left at 13, 14, I stayed away from God because I thought God was so busy in Vietnam and <clears throat> busy with all these other things that, you know, I knew he loved me, beyond, you know, and I loved him, but I thought he had one eye closed, you know, and I always thought just before I pass away or whatever, die, I'll ask God to forgive me. And once uh, I was shot right in the top of the skull with a 22 pistol from, I showed the guy the gun and he's like, does it work? Pow, shot me. And I went to the hospital, got a couple stitches, and I was driving back home, and I thought I could hear God say, I thought you were going to ask me to forgive you of your sins. And I went, whoa, God forgot all about it. And then still I didn't, still I didn't, still I didn't. And, you know, I've been called, I've had a, uh, I don't want to say a preacher, but an evangelist call in my life ever since I was a kid you know, nine, 10 years old, I used to testify in church and I knew that God was calling me to the pulpit. I knew that for sure. And finally, you know, after the TV show, I was a little lukewarm. And finally, after Beth passed away five years ago in June, then a year or so later, I asked God, listen, man, I need a Holy Ghost filled woman. I don't care what I'd God, could I have one a little taller and thinner? Could I, you know, please, God, I need, you know, right? I, Lord, I got to go back to bikers. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to be in, there's called the Dirty Dozen. You've been, you know, only certain guys convicted of murder could go there. And so 
I said, please, I, you know, I want to serve the Lord. I want to see my mother. I want to see all my grandpas and grandmas, the ones that went before. Please, God, I need, I got to have, you know, a partner. I can't find my car coming out of Target. I can't, you know, I just have been married. Like I've had girlfriends at 15 and, you know, I need a mate. I need, you know, I read the Bible. Adam had a, a partner, a mate. I said, you know, I can't be single and I can't do that. Please, God. I'll, and if you give me, Lord, a mate that as loves God, I will serve you so much that you're going to freak out. And so thus I met my Francie and, uh, you know, together we're speaking across the United States and wow. coming to a town near you. And her testimony is like, I thought mine was, you know, let a God. Well, I'm glad I get to do this show and you guys don't get to hers, hear hers. You X me right out. Wow. Well, you know, dog, I want to hear more. We want to hear more about uh, your life of faith and your journey with God. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back with more with dog. Stay tuned. It's going to get more interesting as we hear more about his story. Thank you. With our thanks for your generous gift this month, request your 16-month Jewish Christian Victory Calendar when you give in support of Cornerstone Television Network. Inside the calendar, you'll discover stunning photos of sites in the land of Israel that have been vital to the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Plus, find encouragement through Scripture, reminding us of God's faithfulness in the midst of struggle. The 16-month Jewish Christian Victory Calendar features beautiful pictures of the Holy Land, room to track important dates, American and Jewish holidays, and a victory scripture for every month. Thank you in advance. Your partnership allows us to reach the lost through Christian television, provide our 24-7 prayer line, and support outreach to widows, orphans, and more. To request your calendar, call us at 888-665-4483 or give at ctvn.org slash donate. If you're joining us now, we have the one and only dog, the bounty hunter with us today. And his story of redemption is so powerful. Dog, you were sharing just before the break a little bit of your childhood and what kind of led you down a path of trouble. Um, but ultimately, God turned around for his good. Can you tell us how did you become a, do a bounty hunter? Like what made you choose bounty hunting? Well, I was in prison in the 70s uh, in Texas and I uh, was the warden's barber. Okay, so in the prison, the most prestigious, I am spoiled of God my whole life. Mm -hmm. My whole life. I'm so spoiled. And so the most prestigious jo job in prison was warden's barber. So my barber shop was outside the prison gate and I was like, you know, hi, mucka, mucka, I was a big shot. And so one of my friends was thrown in the hole and because it, one of his people died. And as he was running from, you know, he jumped out of the hole and he was running, going down the road at the prison, going to escape. When your people die in prison, they throw you in what's called solitary confinement, the hole, because you're going to go to the funeral. You know, I don't care if it's your mama, auntie, whatever. When you, you're going, escape, whatever. So they take a precaution and throw, you know, uh, throw you in the hole so you don't run away. So my good friend, uh, Bigfoot was his name, was he jumped out of the hole, was running down the road. And so I'm in the barbershop and I see him running and I could hear the rifles in the towers cocking and then guards saying, freeze, freeze. Right. And so I just jumped out of the, out of the barbershop and started running after him because I ain't letting him kill my friend. And in, in prison, we was known as salt and pepper. <laughs> and so, uh, I, I didn't know that there was a Lieutenant right behind me going to shoot me in the back. Cause he thought, you know, we're brothers. Uh, uh, Bigfoot was like six seven, six eight, and I'm five seven, and uh, just as and he didn't have, he couldn't run like uh, his nationality. He couldn't run. He's a big guy. He, he could barely man. run. So he was a black man. I, you can say it. Huh? He was a black man. Yes, sir. Yeah, I guess salt and pepper. Yeah. So uh, as as uh, he was running, I 
reached out and grabbed him by the very, got him by the leg and down he went, right? Mm -hmm. And so the lieutenant realized, wow, you know, dog is capped catching Bigfoot. He's not running with him. So he took these handcuffs and threw them in the dust. And I say this a lot. The, he said the magic word, hook him up, bounty hunter. And I said, Lieutenant, I can't hook him up. But I had known what a bounty hunter was because I used to watch uh, the uh, Sky King, the Lone Ranger, uh, Wanted Dead or Alive with Steve McQueen. You know, I'm, I'm uh, not old, but I'm ripe. And so I, uh, I knew, and I told the Lord, listen, I'm, I apologize. I repent for doing what I did, but how am I, you know, my dad said, you can't even get a job, a driver's license. How are you going to date a girl? How are you going to rent an apartment when they ask you, are you a felon? I said, I'll put, we'll discuss. Nah, you're done. So, uh, all of a sudden, boom, bounty hunter went in my mind. I said, Oh, most bounty hunters back in the days were bad guys and then turned good guy because something happened big in their life. And so I got out of prison February 6, 1979, and I ordered a badge in the comic book. And it's, a, I mean, there's so much story that I, it's a lot of it is in the Nine Lives and County book. But I ordered the badge and all that. And I started bounty hunting, the top federal most wanted. Then the FBI said, well, you can't do this. You're embarrassing us. They introduced me to bail bondsman. And then uh, Tony Robbins, Martin Sheen, the Osbournes. They, uh, I was a speaker at Tony Robbins once in a while. And all, all, I met all those high mucka mucka uh, movie people, especially uh, the Osbournes and Martin Sheen. And they said, you, bro, you need a TV show. You mean you boot the door down in someone's house and you go in there and drag the mother or father away from the kitchen and put them in the back seat. And then, you know, then you beat them up and pour Jesus down their throat and then give them a cigarette. <laughs> my God. They said, who does that? And I said, well, dog, the bounty hunter. My first name is dog is God spelled backwards, bro. I'm on a mission from God. Wow. So a uh, God has always been in the center or to live it to the side of my life. And every day is a struggle. I mean, for me, you know, for everybody, every day, every day, Paul said, I, you know, I, I pray all day. David said, I repent for things I remember. I don't even know I did, but it's a lot easier than, oh, was there a camera? Oh, did I leave a fingerprint? Oh, yeah. did I do this? Yeah. Oh, did I do that? Oh my God, did I do that? So uh, there is a hell. And my God, hallelujah, there is a heaven. That's right. And so my and Francie's job is to pump the name of Jesus everywhere we go and everywhere. And our, we're as struggling. It's a struggle. I mean, our love is not struggling, but it's a struggle. And uh, we will triumph over evil. Hey man, well, hey dog. You know we got a couple of minutes left. Uh, I'm your sorry, story. I talk a lot. No, no, yes, no, 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 no. I want to make sure we get this in. You're good. I want to make sure that you have so much to your story. You could probably do a two-hour segment and still keep going. Yes. But your story, every part of it isn't fluff. It has substance. And people might want to know a little bit more about your story. Tell us in the last couple of minutes about your book and how people can get a hold of that. Well, it's called Nine Lives and Counting. You can order it at any bookstore anywhere. And uh, I. I, you know, I have a ghostwriter that helped me. Francie supervised it. Uh, I, this is the third book. Number, the first book hit number one on the New York Times bestseller. I didn't even know what that was. Second book hit number nine or 10, uh, where mercy is shown, mercy is given. This book is climbing the charts. You know, I don't know if there's any been any other Christian book that has hit number one. But I am going after it. And not, yes. you don't, as you guys know, there's no uh, dinero cash to making books anymore. And hardly anybody reads them. I tried to do, I'm not really good at reading. I tried to read the book and, you know, for the, uh, they fired me. But uh, it is a lot. Everything was verified in the book. They verify, 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 verify. Wow. We had, the main story is how I met Francie. And a lot of people, when they lose a spouse, they're lonesome, they're heartbroken. Man, where do you get a load of how I met my friends? So it not only does it 
you know, give what I've been through and that Jesus is real. But uh, I think it, I anybody that's ever read it, even guys that, you know, didn't believe in God have called me and said, dog, man, dog, you know, can I have your email address? They say, I'd like to stay in touch with you. And of course, you know, my uh, powers that be, he say I shouldn't give it out, but I do. <laughs> so I, I, I think it changes it will change the life of anybody. And it shows how me, dog, rawr, rawr, disciple, could give his life over to the Lord. If I could be redeemed, anybody could be Come redeemed. On, if I could do that, yeah. if I could stop and start serving the Lord, it is easy for anyone else. That's so awesome. I think that's the main three or four things in Nine Lives and Counting. Thank you, Jesus, that our yes. Redeemer lives. We are so thankful, dog, that he brought your wife Thank to you. you to point your eyes <laughs> to Jesus. And we're thankful for all that you're doing, spreading the good news of Jesus. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Aloha, you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. When we return, Jay and I are going to discuss how God is capable of turning our disappointments into blessing. It's a conversation that you definitely don't want to miss. And it's next right here on Unscripted Faith. We left the light on for you. Cornerstone Network is your home for Christian television. A place of rest, a beacon of truth, your source of encouragement and entertainment. Welcome home. Looking at the Earth from space is amazing. Secular scientists say that our majestic home planet, with all of its apparent design features to support life, formed by natural processes from a gas cloud billions of years ago. But despite these claims, there is abundant evidence that the Earth is unique, young, and finely tuned by its creator. Our designed Earth with Spike Pissaris. This week on Origins. This week on Hard Questions, we ask our panel of pastors, are there drunks in heaven? How did Mary get pregnant? And does God have favorites? All that and more on Hard Questions, Thursday at 2 p.m. and 9 p.m. and Sunday at 4.30 p.m. We will see you there. Welcome back to Unscripted Faith. I hope you had an opportunity to listen to that conversation we just had with Dog the Bounty Hunter. His story, Jay, of highs and lows is powerful. To think of what he went through as a child that led him into a path of really crime yeah. and then ultimately seeing Jesus restore it all. I love, too, what he said in that um, segment where he said, you know, I've been spoiled all my life. But his story is not that of a spoiled child, all, you know, great parents and raised up in this luxury. But in retrospect, he's been able to look at it and see God's finger all throughout his story. Tell us a time, Jay, that you watched God turn one of your disappointments into a huge blessing. Yeah. First, let me give a quick shout out to Higher Questions. We just saw that on there. I got to give a quick shout out. Higher Questions, I mean, it's off the chain, y'all. So uh, you got to tune in for that. A lot of good stuff there. And that's actually a, a hard question we get all the time. It's like, what do you tell people that, you know, when a baby dies? Yes. Um, and I've had to do, as a pastor, I've had to do funerals or, you know, uh, we, we've heard people have stories of their mother passing at an early age, which mine did. How do you do all of that? Um, I've shared some of that before. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, there's so many stories. Um, yes. My son, um, I was at, a, I was at a, a conference with my wife mm -hmm. and God said, lay your hands on her stomach and declare, yeah. this is before she was pregnant, said, declare that your children are going to be prophetic. 
And, uh, and I was like, okay, so I did that. A year later or so, she's pregnant. And uh, the, we had miscarried a couple of times before and hadn't had anything, but God said prophesy. The power of prophecy mm. is in speaking when God calls you to speak is amazing. So uh, fast forward a little bit, find out the HCG levels, which is when a woman gets pregnant, those are, go through the roof. And they were going up, but there was no heartbeat. So the doctor looks at me in the doctor's room, the office, whatever, and says, if y'all don't have a baby this time, don't worry. You'll have them in the future. I stopped him in the moment. Wow, and I said, no doc, right now. So in the middle of all of that, wow. we were so disappointed. This could have been our third miscarriage. Yes. We were, you know, my wife was scared and I went home. And if I could, I'd get up right now and start pacing <laughs> back and forth. Cause that's exactly what I did. I got in our kitchen mm -hmm. and I started what my wife was cooking. And I started declaring mm -hmm. over our child, God, you gave me a word and Father, I believe that this son is going to come. You said he would be prophetic in the name of Jesus, da 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 da. Mm. And I prayed so much that God turned it in that moment. I knew before we went in, because we were like, when we go in, he said, the baby's not going to be here next time you guys come. I went in, I remember sitting in the lobby. And while I was sitting there, I told my wife, I said, you know what? I don't even need to hear the heartbeat. I know it's there. It wasn't fake. It wasn't phony. It was wow. God. And as soon as we went in and they hooked up that little Doppler to her, that heartbeat came. I ended up getting an opportunity to minister to that doctor Come on. Uh, because he was so moved by my faith. He said, I need people like faith, there are people, wow. men like that of faith in my life. So that's wow. one of the areas that God turned a disappointment, which we thought the baby was gone into a miracle and even an opportunity to share our faith. I mean, especially when you're dealing with something that's that heart wrenching, yeah. like yeah. to be able to have that faith of God to arise in you, to declare in that moment. And that it's impact. This is like, where is he a believer now? Like, what? Well, we left. Um, I I didn't really lead him to the Lord. I just had a chance to share my faith with him and what it meant wow. to me. And uh, we left to Pittsburgh. Right, or left to move to Pittsburgh right after that. So, oh, wow. Lord willing, he may still be thinking about us still to this day. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, hopefully. hopefully. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I know. I you know I think that a lot of times we look at disappointments and thinks, oh, that's the end of the road. Oh man, how could God do this to me? when we don't really realize that it's in those disappointments he's shaping our greatest moment in the future. Like I, I can think of so many different times that I've experienced disappointment. I think about the time when I thought that I was gonna be doing this big modeling career. I was, there were some modeling agencies in New York. I was gonna go there only to find out I didn't go and they were asking me at 15 years old to live in New York. Thanks be to Jesus for not going. I mean, I can't imagine yeah, as a 15 yeah. year old how you navigate city life. Yeah. Disappointments are always in God's hand turned into our greatest blessings. Would you agree? I totally agree with that because all things work together all for our things. good. And so listen, if you're in a situation right now that you're uncertain of what God's gonna do, look at Dog's story, look at our story. He is the God of a turnaround. We'll see you next time on Unscripted Faith. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.